God is good. I just realized uh, I've been forgetting things, and I forgot to return to you the copies of your prayer request you have sent it in for this year. I was supposed to send, send it to you a week before Thanksgiving so you could have time to give thanks for all that God has done. So I sent it to you by, I was going to bring the hard copies, but I sent it to you by email just right now, a few minutes, you should have gotten it now. So we, we will get, it, get, get those things to you. Just wanted to let you know, one of my main role is to pray for all of you, pray for the church, and, and, and I, I see our God answering our prayers, our God has been faithful. And uh, um, today I'm trying to piece together two messages into one, okay? So I may, I may speak really fast, I may, you know, uh, I may take some things out. If you have any questions, please you can ask me later. We can talk about it more. But today's title, it sounds a little weird, a face like a flint. You know, and that's it. What the heck is a face like a flint? You will see it together. Let's all stand for the reading of the word. We'll read from Luke chapter 9, verse 46 to 62. You can follow along with the passage which is on the screen. ESV, or you can follow along in your own Bible. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said, said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Jesus answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we try to stop him because he does not follow with us. Jesus said to him, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up or ascend, ascension, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, uh, James, John, and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what man or spirit you are of. The Son of Man does came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here ends the, the reading of the word. And all God's people say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Initially, I titled the message, Rebuke, being be, uh, titled Rebuke by Jesus. But I thought that title was a little too heavy, so I changed it to a uh, uh, more, more ominous, uh, more weird-looking title, uh, Face Like Flint. And you will see this. Um, we saw this the last few weeks, how Jesus went up to the mountain to pray and took three disciples along with him on the mountain the glory of God was revealed in Jesus as he was transfigured. And Old Testament major figures, Moses and Elijah, showed up in glory and talked with Jesus about Jesus going to Jerusalem, what will take, take place. And, and, and how disciples, three that he took, they were sleeping, they were, uh, uh, they were just woke up and they were confused, and they heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, whom I chose, listen to him. When they came down from the mountain, we saw last week that when they came down, the rest of the 
disciples, nine of them all, uh, arguing with people because apparently there was a father with, a desperate father with a son who was severely demonized, who brought the son to this Jesus' disciples, and they couldn't cast it out, they couldn't heal the boy. And they were all arguing, and Jesus comes and looks at them, and he heals the boy. And all the people are amazed and saw the majesty of God. We ended actually with this passage, which I didn't get, to, I didn't really explain that much. When Jesus took them aside, and he says, in, it says in verse uh, 44, let these words sink in your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered, betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. Three times he's sort of saying they didn't understand it, they were, they were hidden from them, and they couldn't perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this thing. And the main thing that I see here is that they just didn't, after three years of following Jesus, they still didn't understand Jesus. What you see in the rest of the chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke is about how they didn't understand who Jesus was, what he came to do. And he sort of Sort of mini rebuke sessions, also correction, correction sessions. It is Jesus really setting the things clear. In the midst of that, we will see goodness and mercy of God. We will see the God's glory came out. As I was preparing this message, I mean, the one of the mornings I was, being, I was praying through the message, I literally broke down and wept. It reminded me of God's grace for me so many ways. And I, I want to share that with you today. First thing that happened, what is that? Is it me? Hello? First thing that happened is after Jesus told them that he is going to be betrayed, and that he's going to go and suffer in Jerusalem, first thing that happened right after that is there were argument happened among the disciples. I can sort of imagine, I can sort of imagine Peter and John and Jim acting on the other, other uh, the part, disciples, if you were here, we would have done it. Because we weren't here, you couldn't do it. I bet you, we say, see, Jesus took us to the mountain. We are the special ones. We are the great ones. You guys are just whatever. And other nine disciples were upset. This was an ongoing debate, argument going on. It was, one the, it was the only time. Other time, even the night before Jesus goes to the cross, disciples are fighting about who was the greatest. Remember, this is why Jesus washed their feet to show them about humility. And, and so you see, when, in this, when Jesus just said, I will be going to Jerusalem to die and they'll betray me, they just they totally didn't understand. They thought, they still are stuck on Jesus, the Messiah, the conquering king. And when he comes as a king, I'm going to be, we're going to be up there, you know, with him in glory and all. This is what they were thinking. And so Jesus, in the, there's what Jesus does is, knowing their heart, what's going on, he brings a little child and standing next to him. And Jesus tells them, in those days, children, rather than thinking of cute, yeah, of course they are cute, but Jesus' children had no authority. Often they had very little value. And Jesus is now a well-known rabbi, very, very respected. On, but on the, this little boy had no authority or service. He brings a little boy next to him, and he says, those who receive this little one receives me. I mean, those who receive me receives the one who sent me. And Jesus says, he, you are the, the one among you who is the least among you all, he is the greatest. Just begin to redefine what it means to follow the, say, the Messiah who will suffer and die on the cross. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Mark chapter 10, verse 45, in that passage. Let me little read these passages. Mark 10, 30, 43, 45. But it shall, be, it, shall be, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be the, your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even, because even the Son of Man, the Messiah didn't come to be served, but to serve, and he gave, gave his life as a ransom for many. 
keep your master. This Messiah who came, to came to serve, not to be served. And he gives us ransom for many. How much more so are you in the kingdom of God? The greatest one is one who serves to the most. Greatest among you is the least among you, Jesus said. It's because the cross of Christ on Jerusalem redefines everything about in this life. In this life, you have power and authority. You're up there. You have all the people around, not in the kingdom of God. Because kingdom of God resembles the heart of God. God who humbled himself. God who emptied himself to serve and love. If that's the God, the nature of the kingdom of God is about serving. It's about humility. It's love poured out. You see, they didn't understand. How about us? It's interesting how this passage ended up on the Sunday when you have an election for elders and leaders. You know, I tell you, when often people think that being a deacon and elder is about being a leader in the, or having a status or position. No, it is called to serve. It means you call to serve, be the lowest of them all. You are, you are being called to be the lowest of them all, carry all the Carry the garbage bags, vacuum the church. That's what you're called to. The kingdom of God, the one who serves, is the leader, not the other way around. This is what God is calling us. The second thing that you see, this is getting a little worse and worse. And now, John, so now John is in trouble here. Apostle John is in trouble. John says, Master, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name. You told, them to, you told them to stop because they were not with us. They were not following with us. And Jesus said to them, said to him, do not stop him. Those, not, those who are not against you is for you. You know what is this is? Tribalism. You know, you heard the word tribalism, right? Why did they try to stop the guy? Actually, they saw this person who is not with them casting out demons in the name of Jesus. He was not part of our group. They would, why, did, why did they try to stop him? Because he was not following, they were, he was not following with us. He was not in our group. He's not, he was not in our clique. He was not in our tribe. You see, listen, tribalism is not Christianity. Tribalism is not Christianity. They are trying to stop the work of God. Why? Because the work wasn't from their tribe. They are asking wrong question. They are asking, are you with us? Rather than asking, are you with Jesus? Are they with Jesus? We have a tribalism in, the, in our age has many different names. Blacks against whites. Ethnic tribalism, male against females, gender tribalism, evangelicals against charismatics, theological tribalism, young versus old, generational tribalism, urban versus suburban, community tribalism, rich versus middle class or poor, economic class tribalism, Republican versus Democrats, political tribalism. These are all wrong. All wrong. Isn't what, isn't this what Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4? Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body, one spirit, just as also you're called with one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over who is over, through all, and in all. Because God brought us into unity in oneness. We are called to unite, unity, not separate. Question is not whether they are with us. Question is, are they with God? Or are they with Jesus? If they're with Jesus, if they're with God's will, we can work together. We can work together. No tribalism. Amen? Now, the next, next verse, 51, is, listen, this is, so important. I don't know how to say it. Your Bibles will not, if they are, you have a good Bible, you should have highlighted it in yellow. 
I, because it, but it is not. I know. Just verse, just one verse. And often what, what you, you, you miss a lot of things here because if you look at verse 51, it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up or to be ascended, okay, about Jesus going to Jerusalem and dying and, and crucified and, you know, and, and ascended, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is a one simple verse. You know, and I put some different translation. NIV says, resolutely, resolutely set out. NASB said, determined to go. Aramaic, Aramaic translated English says, prepared himself to go. Uh, uh, Bible for everyone. New Testament said, settled in his mind to go. Now, literally here has two thoughts. He set his face certain direction. Also can also mean his Purpose in his desire, his, he decided in his heart to go to Jerusalem. There's a verse in Isaiah 57, 50, chapter 50, verse 7, talk, talking about the servant song, the Messiah was coming. In that verse, says in this way, you don't have the verse, I, I, I'll, tell, I'll read it for you. What it says in this way, but the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, therefore I have set my face like a flint. And my face is set. Like a flint. I know that I shall not be put to shame. He's saying, I set my face like a flint. And to the point when you look at the next verses, that Jesus is actually walking his journey. Now from this passage on to chapter 19, verse 44, all that, almost 11 chapters, Luke says, Jesus is on the journey, on the way to Jerusalem. Every time you will say, he is on the way to Jerusalem, on the road to Jerusalem. And that's the thought that Gospel of Luke says he's on the way to Jerusalem. Almost to the point Jesus, he set his face, even when he's walking, he's, he set face on that Jerusalem. Always, no matter what direction he's going, he's looking at Jerusalem. Always walking and looking at Jerusalem. Almost in that way. He set his heart to go to Jerusalem. Let me stop here. This is what really got me. Broke my heart thinking about this. I don't know if I can say it, uh, say it without... Uh, uh, emotion in me. We are celebrating Christmas in just a few weeks. You know what this Christmas tells me is this thing. God from eternity set his mind, set his heart to send Jesus to Jerusalem to die. It was not just an accident. Oh, they, they sinned. What shall we do? Not that. From eternity before, even before they did anything, he has got a determined in his heart Purpose in his heart to send Jesus to go to Jerusalem, to die on the cross to set us free. Christmas tells me that God has been thinking about me. God has planned to save me and love me. You see, here Jesus says, next, you know, three, three, three years he ministered to show who he was. He's the Messiah that came according to the Bible. Now, next three, next six to nine, but he's showing that he came to be, he came as a Messiah who will suffer and die to save people. He's showing himself this. So everything he does from now on, every teaching, every miracle, everything he does has cross in the back of his mind. Everything in his journey, every story he told, every miracle he performed from now on, and every conversation which he will engage from this point and on has cross pulsating in the back of his mind. You have to look at next, Luke chapter 10, the 19, you have to look in that understanding. Everything Jesus has crossed in his mind. Little he determined to make the journey, he resolutely tightened his lips, set his jaw, and fixed his eyes on the cross, on the resurrection. That's what he did. That's what Christ did. Now, this, in light of that, now I want you to see what's happening. Next few passages are amazing. You see how they didn't understand his heart. Look at 52. And he sent, because Jesus set his mind to go to Jerusalem, they begin the journey. He sent messengers ahead of him, and they went into the village of Samaritans to make a preparation for him because Jesus and his disciples, at least 12 of them and more, a whole bunch are traveling. 
so they can they need to find a place to rest and they are really lodging so that he sent some people to go ahead and check it out verse 53 but the people did not receive him because his face was toward Jerusalem they saw he's walking funny whenever his face is always toward Jerusalem every single time you know and his Samaritans knew where he was going and they were not happy because Jews and Samaritans hated one another. It was many, many centuries born hatred. They were, they, so therefore, out of their nationalism, out of their ethnic, what do you call, on the sense they rejected Jesus. The animosity, animosity between Jews and Samaritans goes back to 700 BC, at least 700 years before Jesus came. Their mutual hatred was so strong. Assyrians came and conquered the northern uh, kingdom of Israel about 700 BC. And when they came, what they did, uh, they, they, when they conquered any land, they took the people, take the land people, and they took it under the land and mixed them with other people. And they brought other peoples into the land to mix so that they would try to you know, um, root out their uh, what you call, culture and all kind of things. And when, this, when those people came, so they are known as mixed people. Some Jews and you know, others mixed. They are, if you want to use the word, mongrels, okay? They were mixed race. And, you know, and when, by the time Jesus came, they had their own version of the word to worship God. They had their own version of Pentateuch. They built a temple in Mount Gerizim, which later down the line, Jews came and destroyed it. They hated each other, and in turn, some of the Samaritans snuck into the temple, Jewish temple, Israel, and they scattered the ashes of the bones all over and desecrated. They hated each other to the max. So most Jews, when they have to go from north to south, south to north, they will not go through it. They will just go around, go across the river, and they'll go around and take three days extra. But Jesus is not going through Samaria. And they said, you are going to Jerusalem. We don't like you. I don't, I, we don't care what you did. But you, we, 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 and so we are no friend of ours. When, when John and James saw this, they got so upset. This is where they get the name, Sons of Thunder. The gospel, God, God, apostle John later on became an apostle of love. He was angry, very hot-tempered guy. And Jesus, Jesus, look at those guys. Should he tell us fire from heaven to come down and consume them all? Just like Elijah did. Remember Elijah a few, a few days ago? You can do it. Then, you know, why don't you do it? Say, I tell fire come and burn them down. They, was, they were angry for Jesus. How dare you reject Jesus? Let me stop here. I, bet, I don't know if you ever had those. Sometimes you watch some of those social media posts. You get so angry at these people saying stupidest things. Don't you feel like that? I remember I, I saw some post, some this Korean weird guy, they're talking about, talking smack about Jesus. I don't even know what they're talking about. I feel like, God, you need to strike those guys. Strike them with the fire, whatever. You know, and, you know, and those people who make you know, fun of, you know, you heard about those people you know, who are desecrated churches in Europe. You know, with, with, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, they... they all kind of, you know, about, did, I mentioned this last week, did you know about this church in England where this guy came and talked about how, you know, Jesus was transgender, transgender and all kind of things, and all those things, and he's like, what the heck are you talking about? God, <laughs> you feel like that sometimes. How can you as Christians, it's okay with abortion, the thing, whatever, people get all kind of things. And Jesus looked at him. You misunderstand. You are totally misunderstanding. What did I come to do? Jesus rebuked them. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Solomon didn't come to destroy people's lives. He came to save, not to destroy. What are you talking about? Sometime in the name of following God, even our generation, some of us get upset at people who not, do not know any better. 
we get angry and whatnot. We have, we have, you know, like if we had, you know, if we have a laser coming out, we'll kill people. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Holy righteous anger, you think. The disciples are furious. How dare they reject Jesus? John and James, John and James let a call sons of thunder. Should he tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? But there was an incident. I don't know if you remember the story in the Bible. Elisha, prophet Elisha. Remember, I don't know how many of you remember this story. In, in this, uh, uh, king, what was his name? Um, one of the kings of North, North, North sent 50 men, soldiers, to uh, uh, get prophet Elisha. Prophet Elisha says, oh, and he said, oh man of God, the king says, come down. Eli Eli Elijah said, Elijah answers. If I am the man of God, let the fire come down from heaven and consume them, you and your 50. And he did it. And that's it. King sent second 50, and then this come, and he get consumed. Third guy come, please, don't do it, please. You know, and whatever, that, that story. Anyway, this is what they're thinking. Thinking about. Jesus rebuked them. And so what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about the kingdom of God? He said, in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, I say to you who are listening, who are hearing me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Isn't that what Jesus said? You do not know what, what heart you have. You do not know what kind of spirit you're of. You're missing, on, missing the, the cross. Listen, merciful spirit is essential to all who want to be on the road with the Son of God. Mercy is important because he, it, this is key in our hearts. You know, so often in the name of doing God's work, God's, God's will, don't forget it is always about his love and mercy and grace. Our weapon is never sword. Our weapon is never a, a stick or anything. No, our weapon is prayer, humble prayer, weeping before God and crying. And our weapon is loving. We turn evil good for evil. That is our His call for us. And next, and and then on, on, on there are three stories that comes after this. First one, I called it. I, I will follow you. Remember the song? I will follow him. You know the song? I, I love the song from Sister Act too. You know, follow him wherever he may go. And near him I will always be, for nothing can keep me away. He is my destiny. I will follow him. You know the song, right? And uh, this guy comes, three people comes and said, they say, we want to follow you, Jesus. We'll go wherever you, wherever you go. And they yet, even though they said they want to follow him, they didn't understand they didn't understand who he was, where he was going. And in, in turn, he said, God is asking, do you know who you are following? Do you know who you, who you love? Do you know who I am? You know what I came to do? He's challenging us. Do you love me as you ought to love me? First one goes this way. As they were going, verse 57, along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. I can see that the song coming, I will follow you. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, the Messiah who came, has nowhere to lay his head. This guy thought, but maybe he was excited about what they saw in Jesus. We want to follow you, Jesus. Jesus said, do you know where you're going? It's not all about glamour. It's not all of our, of our comfort. Do you know where I am going? Even the foxes have holes to go back to. The birds have a nest to go back to. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you know who, who you're following? And if you're following me, that's where you're going to go. You may not have homes anymore. You may not have homes anymore. This, this is a story that I, I think I might have shared once few years ago, and, and I looked back, and I was just undone. Oh, so you know the song, one of the songs I love to sing? 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't know how many remember the story behind how this song was written. You remember me telling the story? How this song was written? It's from a song from India, about 1850s. A Welsh missionaries came to India, and the whole area, those days, oh, there was no, all the states were sort of together, it was Assam area. And there was a, you know, and there, there were, this came to this tribe of people known as headhunters. To show their bravery, they will have more heads. They have to gather heads of the people they killed. They put it in front of the house to show they're brave, to show that they can protect their wives. And in the trial, the first converted, convert and his wife and children, they came to know Christ. And they're very, very attractive, attractive in their faith. And many are hearing the gospel through them. The chief of the, the tribe, the village, didn't like it. And he put them, you know what? You need, you need to recant this Jesus, the, the Western the religion, whatever. And he has arrows all you know, ready. If you do not recant, you're going to shoot, arrow your kids. And as his kids were arrowed, he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And he will not recant. And now they arrowed his, they said, we're going to kill your wife. And he, next verse, said, so though no one join me, I will, I will follow. And then he, she was killed. And then he was killed. And, and, and somehow down the line, when missionaries came back to the town, sometime later, whole village came to know Christ because the chief of the tribe came to know Christ through their martyrdom. Some of the words that he, the guy said before he died, they took those words and make, made it into a hymn. The song that in the village, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Jesus says, do you know who you are following? Do you know where you are going? I like what Kent Hughes says in his commentary. If you confess him as Christ, you must cling to his bloody cross as your only hope. And you must take up your own cross as you deny yourself and follow him. Are you willing to, are will, are you willing to let go of your comforts? There's, no, there's not a lot of glamour in following after me, Jesus is saying. What you must embrace the life of discomfort, even pain. But Christ's reward will outweigh our value, anything lost by following him. The second person who comes, Jesus said, and to another, another person, Jesus said, you follow me. And the person said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Doesn't this sound really harsh? My father is, has, has died. Can I at least go and bury my father, which is the right social obligation, just something you, you should do? Can I do that first? Jesus said, no. Let them leave the dead to bury their own dead. To leave those who are spiritually dead to take care of the physically dead. But you first, he's saying, well, you first, as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. He's saying that, uh, you know, the ur that there is an urgency and importance of what Christ calling him to do, to follow him. Is that important? Even to, even to, even higher priority than some of the obligations in life. He's not saying, do not take care of your parents. Some, some, some people thought, you know what? He, if you look at his story very carefully, he didn't see die. Can I bury my dad? Probably, probably he, his, his father is not dead yet. If he was dead, he wouldn't be there. He's, he's already at home. But he's saying, my, my dad is you know, old. Can I wait until my father dies and that I bury him that I can come? Can I come a little later? No, now, Jesus, now is a time to follow him. Not later, now. The third person, this even sounds even harsher. Yet another, another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say 
farewell, goodbye to those at my home. Can I at least go and say goodbye to my family? I'm not saying, can I wait and, you know, you know, bury my dead? Can I at least go and just go back to my family? But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The image that Jesus uses, if you are, if you are plowing, plowing, right, in, in, the, in the field, and then, you know, you're trying to put, you know, plow a straight line, if you're looking back, you know what's going to happen? It's going to go all over the place. If you are plowing, you focus and go where you go. If you look back, you cannot go straight. Jesus is saying, following me is so utterly important. Utterly important. So important to the point some of the... Uh, the things, the obligations you have, even those things, this has to come before everything else. Before everything else. Remember the word, you know, just remember this, you know, I don't even know this passage, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all the things I'm worried about, anxious about, he said, I'll let it unto you. It's about priority of the kingdom of God. Let me stop here. Let me, I want you to think about this. I'm so excited. I'm sweating inside here. Think about this. The God, the God of universe, his desire to save us, give us life was so important. He said his mind from eternity to go to Jerusalem. Jesus said his mind to go to Jerusalem and share and to die for us. This is how important it was. God, let living God's glory coming, even to die on the crosses, set us free and give us life, life and really make us alive. That's what he came to do. The following him means you're following after his purpose, which God set his heart to go to cross. How much more so is his calling to follow me? How important that is. Urgent. It is significant. It's not tomorrow. It's now. It is now. Because that's what he came to do. That's who he was. You see that Mount, Mount of Transfiguration was all about him, how God has got the Father purpose him to go to Jerusalem. To save people from sins. Healing and all the miracles was about was sort of result of supposedly, you know, and this result of what he will do on the cross when he shed his blood so that he will take care of all the, our sinful issues and all that, and all these will be, you know, the, the peripheral extra stuff that he, God brings in our life. Everything was about him coming to say, seek and save the lost, to give his life as ransom for many. That's what he came to do. That Savior is calling, calling us to come and follow him. We, cannot, we are called to follow anything no less than that. This is worthy. This is what Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Brethren, brethren I do not regard to have regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what, li what lies behind and press and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on to know him better. I press on to seek his will. It's about his glory and grace. Almost done. He set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. This was what Christmas is about. This is what Luke is saying all gospels about. God set his heart to save us from sin and the ravages of sin. Make us a people that he will, people that belongs to him. Set us free. That's what he came to do. That Savior says, when you say, I will follow him, that means, it means to come and die so that you may live. It's come, come to die and follow me. Following is that. Because he's worthy. 
And this is what he came to do. Set his face like a flint. Set his resolutely to go to Jerusalem. That Savior did it for you and me. Our Lord and Savior did that for you and me. Come and follow me. Come and follow in my journey to Jerusalem. So next chapter 10 and on, we'll go into next year. We will see how we will go in the journey with him to Jerusalem together. See him on the road. And see his heart, how he loved and how he cared and how, how he poured out his life for us. He is calling us into that journey, following him. And let's say, praise him, come. I love the song. I wish I was a little better singer. So I could have sung the old old songs. I will follow him. I'm not saying we should sing this song, okay? <laughs> our Savior, our Lord, our God, determined, set his heart, set his mind from eternity past. That he will go to Jerusalem, lay down his life so that we may be saved, we may find life. That is the gospel. That is the word of God. That God says, following me, living life, is to come and be part of my journey to Jerusalem. Will you go with him? Today, not later. Today, will you walk with him? His, we may know fully His love and grace, not only for us, for the whole world. Come. We love you, God. We honor you, God, who was so determined to save us, so determined to set us free, give us life. We love you, God. We are yours, God. We want our life reflect your beauty and your glory and your mercy and love. God. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who shed, poured out his life on the cross, love of God the Father, and the fellowship and the Holy Spirit, and the communion of the Holy Spirit can be upon all who are gathered here, all who would follow him, who will call upon his name, be upon us from this day until now, until forever and ever. Amen.